I'd like to start by just taking us before the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you. And I pray that you'll use me and use your words through me to bless your people. Pray that this, the words that I speak will fall onto the ears of your people and that we will see you, Lord. In your heavenly name, amen. Well, thank you, Dwayne, for reading that. We're going to walk through this. And I'll be honest, I'm struggling a little bit because the energy in this room right now is amazing. I turned around and looked, the, whole, the entire children's ministry had to come down to see how awesome worship was. So thank you guys again. That was amazing. I am so happy to be here and I'm so happy to bring God's word to you. So we're starting this new series, The Unexpected Pursuit. We're coming out of a series where we really did it for 11 weeks, right? Where we were doing firm foundations, right? And so I kind of got up here, the things that we learned about God in these firm foundation, that God is good, faithful, just, love, wise, awesome, gracious, mighty, merciful, forgiving, and jealous. Amazing series. But you know what wasn't being felt on Easter morning by his disciples? Any of these things. That morning, God was unknown to those people, to the people who had been following Jesus, because what had happened? The person they were expecting to be the one was what? He was dead. He had been crucified. They lost. And it is so important to, to understand this because I know I like to think that had I been in the disciples' shoes that I, I would have known that more was going on. But that's not the case. We do not, we only have hindsight that tells us that Jesus rose from the grave, right? They did not expect this. This was not what they were expecting. And this is actually such a huge part of what was going on at that time that we see throughout the Gospels that the disciples did not understand who Jesus was and what he was sent to do. We look at that Judas betrayed him. Why did Judas betray him? Because Judas was so frustrated that he hadn't yet taken on the government. He was disappointed because he knew what the Messiah was supposed to be. But Jesus wasn't living up to his expectations. We see that just moments before Jesus goes and gets crucified, that the disciples are arguing about who's going to be sitting at his right hand and his left because they didn't understand. They didn't get what was happening. And so then we see as Jesus is arrested, what happens to the disciples? They run, they flee. We see Peter, who is one of the closest disciples to Jesus. He then turns around and denies Jesus three times because he's so scared that he didn't know what was going on. His expectations were not being met. This was not how it was supposed to go. They fully believed that Jesus was going to come in and defeat Rome. He was going to be Joshua from the Old Testament. He was going to take the promised land back from the Romans. This was what they were expecting. But that's not what happened. And so as Jesus is laying in a grave, they are hiding. They are scattered because they lost. And now if they, would, if they can crucify Jesus, the one who they thought was the Savior, was the Messiah, what else can happen to them. This is what we encounter on Easter morning. We think of Easter morning and right away we go to the resurrection because we've seen it all. It has all been written down for us and we know the result. And he is risen, right? Amen. But that is not the feeling of the disciples on Easter morning. And so we're going to start this new series by kind of going through how Easter morning looked to some of the disciples. And so we're going to start in Luke 24, 13, where Dwayne was so gracious to read for us. And if you've heard me before, I'm going to have a problem where this starts right here, right? Now that same day, okay, I can't start at this because that same day, the same day as what? So we're going to actually backtrack to Luke 24, 1, where this is the story of the resurrection of, of, in Luke's gospel. And I always had loved Luke because Luke, right at the beginning of his gospel, he tells us that he is investigated all these things. And so, for those of you who don't know, I have a degree in history. It's not what I use it for. I've got a degree in religious studies from Michigan State. It's not a theological degree. 
This is, not, this, is, this is history for me. I love history. And that's what I love to come at this for. But when I go back and see this, on the first day of the week is where we start uh, in Luke 1. On the first day of the week, this is Sunday morning, right? So this is Easter Sunday. Very early in the war- morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Well, why had they gone to the tomb? What was their expectation? Their expectations are that they were putting spices on a dead body. This was their expectation. Jesus was dead. This was customary to add spices to help the smell of rotting flesh and decay. This is why they had gone to the tomb. They weren't expecting to find Jesus not there. He was dead. They knew this. But then as we continue, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, we're right there, I I struggle, but when they entered, I, I don't know that I'm entering. This stone is probably about seven to eight feet tall, weighing probably close to two tons. It took probably five to seven Roman soldiers to roll the stone in front of the tomb in the first place. And now it's moved out of the way. And they know the tomb was being guarded because they had probably seen it already this earlier over the weekend. This would terrify me. What has happened? And then, but yet they entered anyways. So already I know these women are braver than me because I, I, I'd, have, I'd have been like, all right, I, I'm going back. I'll, Peter can try this, right? right? But they entered the, and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, I love how Luke has done this because Luke has kind of already given away the ending, right? Because he's already calling him the Lord Jesus here. He's already told you that there's more to this story right away. And so while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. So if I'm not freaked out by now, Two guys gleaming like lightning. Gleaming like lightning. I don't know that I can stare or look at two people gleaming like lightning. That would, again, I'm freaked out. I'm running away. It, but the women have different reaction. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Now, I'm still really confused here, right? I know Jesus was dead. I watched him crucified. We buried a dead body. We know he's dead. We were just trying to continue the Jewish customs and do the things that a proper Jewish burial requires. But now this is where the women are at. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and the third day be raised again. Now, I have to imagine, if I had already remembered this, I'd have been looking forward to this. They did not remember this. Once these two individuals say this, then they say, oh yeah, he did say that, didn't he? They were not thinking of that because they had lost. They were the losers in this fight. They had picked the wrong horse. This was the the, the status that they walked into. But then they remembered his words. And so what do they do? From there, they're going to come back from the tomb. They told all these things, and I love this, to the 11 and all the others. We tend to think that probably just the 11 were hiding in a room. This tells us there's more people there. There's more people that are either hiding or had probably been hanging around with Jesus for quite a long time. That they are there in addition to just the 11 disciples. We're going to get back to that. That's good. Remember that. We're going to need that again. And so then it tells us some of the women who were there. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. I think Luke is telling this because these are the people he was able to talk to when he was writing his gospel. These are his eyewitnesses. This is his firsthand account of what had happened. And he wants you to know, I've got good witnesses. But we're also talking about first century Rome. And so how did... The disciples handle this news coming from the women. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense to them. Boy, I wish I could say things have changed. (laughs) Women, I'm sorry. We're terrible men. We still think you guys sound like nonsense from time to time. It's nothing that's new. This has been going on for a long time. However, Peter... Peter heard this and said, there's more here. 
And so he got up and ran to the tomb. And it's funny, in, in the Gospel of John, it says that there's another disciple, the one that he loved, went with him. But Peter got there first. So we know Peter's fast, right? Or at least faster than John. So he got up and ran. Now, what I don't know is how long away from where they were hiding was this tomb. My guess it was at least some distance. They weren't hiding around the corner. So Peter gets there. He's probably out of breath. He probably just ran a mile or maybe two miles, something like that, to get to the tomb. Now, bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, which, what did he just learn? That yes, the body's missing, and whoever took it unwrapped him. It seems like a really bad idea on a three-day-old dead body. Because you know what that body's going to do? It's going to stink. Why would someone unwrap this body? This is what he goes away wondering to himself what had happened. Because no sane person unwraps a three-day-old dead body. That's going to cause problems, if nothing else, with your olfactory senses. So he's now confused. But he doesn't want to just believe the women. Because, you know, this is part of what makes the Gospels to me so reliable. Because in history, at that time and age, women could not give testimony. Their testimony was not valid in court. And so Luke, the writer of this gospel, tells you that here is his eyewitnesses. If you're trying to convince people that Jesus is alive, you are not going to use women. Because they would not have been selling this argument to anyone. We see the disciples didn't even be, believe them, right? So we know that this is what, one of the things that makes it trustworthy to me because this is not how you would write it. You also wouldn't write it so that the disciples look like dopes because they should have been the heroes of the story. But no, Jesus was the hero of this story. And so this is why I believe what is written because you wouldn't write it like this if you were trying to just make a document, documentary of this situation. So now we get back to Luke 24, 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, I, I like to go for a walk. Seven miles is probably about as long as I'm willing to go. My wife and I will, will occasionally do the loop at Stony Creek. That's six miles. I know at the end of that loop, I'm ready to be home. I'm ready to sit down. I'm ready to now reward myself with ice cream or a Slurpee or something like that because I just put in the work of six miles. I'm honest, I put in that work so I can eat bad. That's just the way I am. But these guys, this was normal for them. This is how they traveled. They walked around places. Walking seven miles to Maus probably wasn't that long of a trip, considering people traveled this distance all the time. You got to remember what was going on in Jerusalem at this point. This was during the Passover. Jerusalem was packed. People from all over Israel were coming to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. This is one of the things that you did, you looked forward to. This was your big vacation. This was your road trip. You went to Jerusalem for the Passover. So this place is just jammed packed with people. And so they're going back to, to Emmaus, about seven miles. So my guess is, knowing how long it takes me and the shape I'm in, I'm guessing it was a little quicker for them. So I'm guessing this probably would have taken about two hours, is, is my my guess is about what this would take, and that's just pure conjecture. I don't know that for a fact. Maybe they were sprinters. I don't know. But they were talking each other with, with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself came up and walked with them. Now, could you imagine that? Now, I love this next little verse here, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, have any of you ever been in that like going to the grocery store and you see your coworker and you sit there and wonder, go, it's out of place. Is that the right person? You're at the mall and you see someone from church and you're like, I, I think that's Dwayne, but it's not Sunday. Is that really Dwayne? Like you have those, that's not what's going on here. I see it actually with my wife. It's, it's one of the funniest things to see because my wife is a teacher. She teaches little kids. You get a six-year-old who sees their teacher outside of school, it's mind-blowing. You could have the chattiest little six-year-old and they can't talk because all of a sudden their teacher might be a real human being and do things other than just sit in their classroom. Like, I, I swear, little kids have this belief that when the day is done, the bell rings, the teacher goes and recharges in the closet 
in the classroom. They see their teacher outside of the classroom and it, 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 they, they can't handle the concept that, oh my goodness, my teacher's like my parent. This is crazy. That's not what's going on here. They were kept by the Lord from recognizing who he is. But one of the things that is actually really neat, we're going to see in a minute, that Cleopas is one of the names that they say is who is walking down the road to Emmaus. Now, church tradition actually suggests that Cleopas is the same person as in John where they mentioned Clopas. Well, the significance of that is Clopas is probably Jesus' uncle. And he's probably walking either with his aunt or with his cousin. These are people who would have recognized Jesus under any circumstance. And yet they are kept from recognizing him. Because God's got a bigger plan than just giving it away right at the moment. And then I love this. If you don't think Jesus likes to you know, mess with you a little bit, this next couple verses gives that away. He, he certainly likes to, to just kind of, you know, rattle us a little bit. He says, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood there with their faces downcast. And why were they downcast? They were on the losing side. They had lost. All their expectations had been defeated. Jesus was their hope and Jesus was dead. But what's interesting is one of them named Cleopas, which we just said, asked them, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does know, not know the things that have happened here in these days? That tells you that the crucifixion of Jesus was a big deal. If you remember a week earlier on Palm Sunday, he rode through the streets into Jerusalem like a king. People had heard of Jesus throughout Galilee, throughout Jerusalem, throughout Israel. They had heard of Jesus and the things he had done because this is how information traveled. It was word of mouth. And you don't mention just the little things that happened. You talk about the guy who fed 5,000 people with a basket of fish and a couple loaves. You talk about the guy who raises a boy from death. You talk about the guy who tells a man, get up and walk, and he walks, even though you've walked by him so many times and know that he was lame. These are the things that people talk about. And this is the word of mouth that was traveling. And so as all these people gathered around Jerusalem for the Passover and they hear Jesus is in town, Jesus gathers crowds. And so for six days, he's teaching in the temple. And over and over and over, the crowds just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger because everyone has heard now heard of Jesus. This is the setting. And Cleopas can't understand how this traveler doesn't understand this. You haven't heard of Jesus? And of course, Jesus, just to be a wisecrack. What things? Well, what things are you talking about? Cleopas could probably just beside himself. Like, have you been living under a rock? Didn't you hear what happened? They released Barabbas. The guy who causes riots and wants to overthrow Rome publicly. This is the guy they released so they could kill this guy. He was a great teacher, and that's what he says. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the prophets, or all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Now, one of the things you have to also keep in mind is when they talk about crucifixion, this was the ultimate punishment. Because this wasn't just death. This was torture. This was a slow and agonizing death. This is how Rome made its point. You want to cause trouble, we are going to make an example out of you. We will crucify you. And crucifying you means long, painful, slow death. Anyone actually know how you die on crucifixion? You actually suffocate is how you generally die during a crucifixion. Because what has to happen, you have to continually pull yourself up in order to allow your diaphragm and your muscles to allow you to breathe. And so what happens is over time, you slowly lose that ability to keep pulling yourself up for that breath. And eventually you can no longer pull yourself up and you are crushed by your own weight. And you are unable to breathe and you suffocate and die. This is what Rome had done to Jesus. They were making an example of him. You are not going to cause problems in Rome. This is what they were saying. This is where Cleopas and his friend were at 
on this walk to Emmaus, and they are approached by this traveler who doesn't know what just happened. This was a big deal. I can't imagine how Cleopas was handling this traveler. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. Now, the reason the third day is, a, is important is because in Jewish custom, third day you were beyond dead. There is no coming back. Like, there had been stories of people who, like, like would go into a coma type a- aspect and they would come back to life. But Jewish law said three days you were dead. It was over. You were defeated. You were done. And this traveler has no idea what's going on as far as Cleopas knows. And then he goes on to tell us, in addition, some of our women amazed us, which I like this. He's like, our women amazed us. Oh, I don't believe them because they don't count is essentially what he's saying. They had this crazy story. They went to the tomb earlier this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. But as soon as this traveler approached, they were downcast because they weren't believing what the women had said. They were not on the same page. Even though that the women that they mentioned, Luke mentions them by name because they were prominent women in the story of Jesus' life. These were women that they should have believed and they still couldn't do it. Then some of our companions, because they didn't believe the women, went to and found the tomb just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. So really what they're believing and they're saying is someone has stolen the body of Jesus because the one thing they knew without a doubt was that Jesus was dead. This is the Easter morning story that we sometimes forget. This is how it started for all those followers and disciples of Jesus. They had lost. It was over. And now here you are. You have this traveler on the road who doesn't know what's going on. And so Jesus says to them, How foolish you are. Can you imagine hearing that? You're now going to lecture me. You don't know what's happening, and now you're going to tell me I'm foolish? And slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did that not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What I picture here is this two-hour lecture that Jesus is now issuing on the road to Emmaus. You know, it it went from earlier where Cleopas was just talking to his companion, where I actually like picture Ron Burgundy, right? He says, man, that escalated quickly. And the other guy says, yeah, I know, Pilate killed a man. You know, that's what was happening earlier. And now they're getting lectured by Jesus. Didn't you know this was supposed to happen? What do you mean it was supposed to happen? That's not how the Messiah was going to happen. That's not what they believed was going to happen. The Messiah was going to conquer Rome. Can you imagine how short-sighted that is? But that was the prevailing belief then. We have history and, and being able to look back on it to tell us otherwise now. As they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. Now, if you've been lectured for two hours, I don't know that I'm stopping this guy. I'm like, yeah, about time you're moving on. But something else had been happening here. Their hearts had been churning. But they st- They urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. Now, the significance of it being nearly evening is the fact that it was no longer safe to be on the road at night. You were fairly safe on most roads in Rome during the day. But once it was night, all bets were off. Because remember, they didn't have city lights. There wasn't a little bit of light everywhere. When it was dark, it was dark. And so you didn't go out at night because it wasn't safe. So he went in and stayed with them. So I'm sure this is a little bit of an interesting aspect for them, as now this traveler who claimed to not know what had happened, but then told them everything that really they should have been listening to about Jesus had really been foretold. And so when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give to them. And at that moment, their eyes are open. Could you imagine being at that table, being Cleopas at that moment, you had been lectured by this guy for the last two hours on your walk. He claimed to not know what really happened, but yet seemed to know everything, how it had really fulfilled scripture. And now 
He breaks bread and all of a sudden, oh my goodness. That was Jesus walking with. How did we not recognize him? Their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning while as, within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? This is what they'd been experiencing in that two-hour walk. And so what I'm really seeing out of this is that we have an option. And we have a prayer we can make. And I'll be honest, it's a very dangerous prayer. And it's about the most dangerous prayer you can pray. And it's, Lord, I want to see. It reminds me of a couple stories that I'm going to go over real quickly, and we're going to get back to this in just a moment. But there's two stories about following Jesus that I want to highlight here. The first one is from Mark 10, and it's the story of Bartimaeus. <clears throat> now, Bartimaeus was a blind man, and he was in a town where Jesus was approaching, and he heard Jesus was coming. And so he started making a whole bunch of noise, saying, Jesus, Jesus. People tried to calm him down. He had nothing. He was not going to calm him down. He had heard of Jesus and knew what Jesus was going to do. And so Jesus says, who is that? Bring him to me. And so they go and get Bartimaeus and bring him to him. And Jesus says, what can I do for you? Now, he was probably obviously blind. And he probably could have said, what do you mean? What do, you, what do I want you to do for me? I'm, I'm blind. But he said to Jesus, I want to see. That's all he asked for is, I want to see. Now, we think that when he wanted to see, he wanted to see with physical sight. But that's not exactly what Jesus was offering. Jesus was offering so much more than just the physical sight to Bartimaeus. And so Jesus responds to him and says, go, your faith has healed you. And Bartimaeus could see. But what is so interesting about this story is how Bartimaeus responds. Bartimaeus immediately received his sight and followed Jesus among, along the road. He knew the response to being able to see. Now that I can see, I must follow. And that's just so interesting when you compare it to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. It's a man of great wealth. And he goes up and asks Jesus, I have kept all the commandments. I have done all these things. He wants to know what else can he do? And Jesus tells him as nicely as he can, it's not necessarily about what you can do, but if you want to do one thing, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. But then he gives him a command. Then come, follow me. But this young rich ruler couldn't do it. All he could see was his wealth. And that was more than he could overcome. He couldn't actually see. Here's a man who had his sight, but he couldn't see. Where the blind man, as soon as he got his sight, he could see. Because he had been given his sight from Jesus. And so what we really have is we need to know that Jesus will not fit in your box of what you want him to be. When Jesus gives you sight, you have only one choice. And that choice is to follow and so we're going to close in prayer in just a minute here, but what I really want you to see here today is that if you want to follow Jesus, you have one response. You are going to have to see. You're going to have to ask Jesus to see. That's your dangerous prayer. That's your assignment for this week, if you dare, because I can promise you it's a dangerous prayer because your life will not turn out as you expect. If you're going to follow Jesus, it's not going to be your plan that succeeds. It's going to be Jesus' plan that succeeds. And so if you're going to pray this dangerous prayer, be ready for your life to be changed. Because it's going to. That's the only way to work. If you're willing to say, I want to see, be careful of what you ask for. Because it will change your life. It's a very dangerous prayer. But if we want to be followers of Jesus, this is the prayer we must make. And so I'm going to close in prayer right now and we're going to try to do this and we're going to challenge ourselves to see. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to, to share your word with your people. I thank you that we have the hindsight of being able to see that you have risen from the grave. You've defeated death. We didn't have to sit there and think we lost. We know the victory is yours. You have already won. We are so thankful for that victory, Lord. But we need your help. Lord, help me to see. Lord, I want to see. And for all these people that want to pray that prayer, work in us. Give us that sight, Lord, that will follow with the response of following you to where you want us to go. Lord, we thank you so much for this church and for these people that allow us to come here and worship you. We pray all this in your heavenly name. Amen.